What's up, gentlemen? Awesome to see everybody on a really wild day for a recording of the Blind Pig, courtesy of BGObsession.com. Before we dive in, first we'll do intros. Top left is Chris. He hails as Chris. Bottom left is John. He hails as Noon. Boone. Sorry, not Noon. Boone. Bottom right <laughs> is Bob. You can find him at Neophyte. Top right is Mark. He hails as Ohm, and you can find me on as Silent Threat. And Fort and Derek. because Bob Bob's mom is rumored to be a fan of the podcast, Bob did put his pants on. He did. He did. Episode. So we appreciate that. We'll see if that comes up in the conversation on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, gentlemen. So, um, I oh yes, interesting day, interesting two days. John and I kind of I bounced off of John how we handle this and instead of just diving in because I'm sure we all are going to have a lot to talk about. Uh, I figure we would do position groups, um, just so that it's somewhat structured. Because there's a lot to talk about. But the first thing I want to talk about before we dig into the precision groups, we signed two people back from the original roster. Yeah. Uh, as far as people that hit free agency. Today we signed Jamison Crowder. And yesterday we signed, who am I blanking on? Jeremy, Jeremy Reeves. Reeves. Jeremy Reeves. Sorry, today was today and it was both Crowder and Reeves. Uh, yep. Reeves is a two-year deal. Crowder's a one-year deal. You can't even count Crowder. I mean, Crowder had barely, you know, the ink was barely dry on his contract from last year. Right. No, like, it doesn't even count. <laughs> so, I'm just curious, you guys' reaction to those two before we start digging into the people that we brought in from outside. It's kind of a, I don't want to say indictment. Indictment might be too strong of a word because it's not like we don't have some talent. But it's definitely, if you didn't think they were blowing this roster the hell up and rebuilding it, you got to believe that now. Right. I mean, I figured we, I mean, I think we all thought it would, it would not be a ton of those guys, but like I said, setting aside Crowder, one guy, and I don't think Reeves was really even on our, that big of a, one of the guys that we thought was a must resign kind of a thing. So I'm, I'm a little bit shocked. I'm a little bit shell shocked, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I like, I love the Reeves resigning for, I guess, two reasons. One, it's an investment in special teams and it, it just makes sense because he's he's been a solid player. It's also a little bit of a legacy thing. We haven't done a lot of that, obviously, because they've turned over the roster dramatically, but bringing back a guy who fucking earned it, right? He, he earned a re-signing and he's, I think he deserves to be part of this. That one just feels right to me. I'm happy for him and I'm happy that they saw it that way. A homegrown guy. Um and he's now made it through into his third coaching regime, correct? Right. Which is pretty cool. Not very many guys have bridged uh, outside of the top three or four that have gotten contract extensions. I think Reeves might and Tress Way. Uh, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head how many actually have been here since pre Rivera, and it's a short list. You know, we don't we don't get all pros around here very often, so. I, I feel like you kind of got to you kind of got to keep the guys you get, um, and and Reeves has been all that right. So I was thrilled with that. I actually was not unhappy to see them re-sign Jamison Crowder today. Kind of the pros pro. Um, last year he he came in and he did exactly what he was asked to do. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of guys on the boards commented that he was really kind of filling the role of almost a pseudo tight end that he was making those kind of catches last year for the offense and being that easy, that easy outlet. But, you know, the, I don't remember the guy dropping a ball last year that got thrown at him and, and he brought life back to our punt return game when we had none uh, at all. I mean, he's been the only thing vaguely exciting on the punt return side of the ball in four years. I mean, during the regular season, right. We all got excited about Kaz Allen last year before he was one of the final cuts. Other and than you know, excitement as to whether they catch the ball or not. We had a lot of that yeah. excitement before. Well, there is that, yes. I'm talking about actually returning the ball, Chris, not just... Yes. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I was thrilled with that. There are a couple of other guys I'd, I'd like to see him at least talk to, but I'm not dying for anybody else back. Am I the only one who did who thought Crowder was older than 30? I was thinking he was 32, 33. He's still, he's got another three, four solid good years doing what he does. He doesn't yeah. rely on speed, right? He's a technique guy. 
Yeah, that, I, I did not know that. I, I thought he was over 30. So one thing I just want to throw out there, and I don't know, I didn't, I, I was lazy today. It's been a busy week, I think, for all of us. So if you're expecting like a, you know, detailed breakdown of all these guys. Not going to happen. You're not going to get it tonight, probably. But I was just shocked by the sheer volume. And I think, I mean, I, I get dumbass of the year awards so far because last week I talked about how Adam um, had, Peters had telegraphed that they might not be super aggressive in free agency because you build through the draft and all that. Well, hell, we can throw that out the window. I couldn't <laughs> have been wrong about that. Um, but 15 is by my count. We've And it's not over yet. 15 free agents signed, including the two from internally. Um, six on offense, seven on defense, two special teamers. So it's – I don't know what we, how many free agents we brought in the, uh, during the Rivera era. I know that we, this time, the last couple of years, at this point of free agency, we were like, are we going to sign anybody? Or we're why, like, yeah, with Wiley and Gates. What Dallas fans are saying right now, and Jets fans, right? Like, are they going to do anything? Um, and then the guys that we did bring in were, were not what we're seeing here, which I know we're going to talk about that. But I just, I'm just blown away by how aggressive they've been. How many do you think we would, of those 15, how many do you think we would have signed if Ron Rivera was still here and not Dan Quinn and Adam Peters? I don't think they would have wanted to come here. I think that's a big factor. But it's, Quinn, it's the Quinn right question. Kingsbury? Right. It's the right question, right? Four, I'm just over under five, maybe. Yeah. And it wouldn't have been some of the guys that we got. <laughs> well, the other, the other part of that probably would have been there wouldn't have been as much gap or room for it because they would have, been bringing back guys like Cody Barton and, um, you know, name your Ron Rivera signing that they want to give a second contract to. How and many of those were for one year contracts either? That we have like seven guys that are on one year contracts. Uh, and I think in, I just, in a, I, I think I, Rivera would that have been a tough sell to say, yeah, we'll sign you for a year. Well, I can get that anywhere else. <laughs> I just, how long is it? way too long has it been since we've had players that have wanted to come here for something other than a paycheck yeah mm -hmm. because they didn't, they didn't drag anybody here because they offered them huge money they, or, they wanted or, to come here or long-term stability right yeah. or security right that right. what i'm getting the impression and i know it's it's like we're we're commanders fans so we want to believe good things about it but what it tells me is that what we thought and hoped was true that the transition from Snyder to Harris and having a legit GM and bringing in a respected head coach and the draft capital and the salary cap, all those feathers in our cap that we had, they mean something outside of the room here too. They mean something out in the world and the NFL people are falling. I think at least two of these guys have been quoted saying, this is where I wanted to come for this opportunity. The fact that they're signing, like you say, Chris, for, for modest money and short term, they want to be part of something. We we might not have thought that Dan Quinn was like a home run hire, but I think the NFL players see it a totally different way. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's the vibe I'm getting. And the coaches out there too, right? Look at the, the we talked about the Rolodex he had and people wanting mm -hmm. to come and he'd be able yeah. to pull together a solid staff and everything else. This is all related. So I guess let's not waste any more time. Uh, start on the offensive side of the ball. I figure the easy one we kind of touched on. Uh, is Zach Ertz. I don't know that there's anything groundbreaking there beyond what we talked about last week. Um, well, he's we another guy that's 27, Derek. That if we talk about him like he's 33. I think he's 27. I mean, d fact check me if you want, but Zach Ertz. Well, no, well, Zach Ertz well, is here in the league. Yeah, Zert Ertz has been around for a while. 33. He's 33. Okay. Well, I don't know where the hell he got that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I saw several comments about what the hell are we doing signing a guy that's a year older than Thomas. He but plays so like a twenty-seven-year-old. <laughs> he does. He does. He Thomas. definitely does, plays an active tight end. He is not a lumbering tight end. He is very active, and he plays. And I don't think we're expecting him to be the lead guy, right? He's a no. he's a locker room guy and a meeting room guy, and a and he's a bridge guy. between. Don't King you think Murray. that's a clear strategy in this? Is that we hired. a like we hired a bunch of guys to three-year contracts more than we probably realize, and you figure those guys are still in their prime if we're giving them three years. The some of the other guys like Wagner, like Zach Ertz, the I mean they can still play at a high level, but 
that's got to be like mentorship, mm -hmm. changing the tone in the locker room, work ethic, being yep. a professional. That's got to be a. There's a whole segment of these guys that I think that's the role they're going to play, which is really smart. Um, one of those guys, and I guess we can jump right into O line. Uh, center Tyler Biata, Tyler Biatish. I really want to call him Tyler Badass just because it looks, it sounds cooler. But I guess I heard it's it's pronounced Biatish. And uh, guard Nick Allegretti. I believe they both got three year deals, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. They did. Um, so two big time interior O line additions. Tyler has been a starter for multiple seasons. Uh, Allegretti has not. Uh, he did start a number of games last year, including the Super Bowl, where, fun fact, while blocking on a play, he tore his UCL, which is the uh, unilateral, uni... John, you could probably say it better than I can, but the ligament in your elbow that Tommy that creates the Tommy John injury for baseball pitchers. So tore that in the beginning of the Super Bowl, ended up playing six, or not the beginning, but he ended up playing 60 additional snaps and finishing the game with a torn UCL uh, and only winning because of it. But those are two big time O lineman additions. And Beatus, uh, I gotta, I gotta get that name down. I'm gonna say badass. Badass was a Pro Bowler in 2022. I mean, he's we're also hurting our our opponents right in the division. You gotta love that as well. Mm -hmm. I've heard several commentators say that that the one of the biggest advantages of Beatus, in addition to being physically pretty solid, is a great a great stabilizing veteran center for presumably a rookie quarterback. You need to have someone there who can make the line calls and, and understand the game and help this kid along. And if nothing else with both him and Allegretti, the interior of ROL with Cosme, even if these are floor guys and we ended up, we end up bringing in additional higher end or drafting somebody, this is a pretty good floor for an offensive line in a transition year like this. I'm, I'm impressed with what they did there. And going into a draft that's supposed to be one of the best tackle drafts in like 20 years. Um, so they're, you know, they're grabbing the guys that maybe aren't going to be, there aren't going to be as many of them available in the draft to build, to rebuild the interior. I think that's smart as well. I, you know, I think you can, you can look at the all 15 of these guys in, in, in a, in one big picture and get, a really good picture of what Adam Peters thinks of this year's draft. You know, look, we've pretty much filled the defensive. I realize we're not talking about defense yet, but, but in the overall scheme of things, we pretty much filled the DE room, right? We, and this is not a strong draft for the edge. I mean, everything I read about it is that once you get out of like the, the second round, there's just not going to be much in terms of edge. In fact, I read something the other day that this whole draft is relatively weak as far as depth is concerned. And that once you get down into the middle of fourth round or early fifth round, you're looking at guys that in previous years would have had an undrafted free agent rating on them. That that's, that that's how slim this draft is that really it's the first four rounds. And after that, not a lot. And edge is not a strong position. Uh, tackle is garden center. Not so much. So with the caveat though, Bob, that we they don't fucking know. They they're just, you know, I mean, it's no, you're right. You're right. That's the only caveat is um sometimes uh, all those those statements that are made by the draft experts don't prove to be well if true. if we only had a GM who excelled in late round picks. No, man. <laughs> so you want to talk about the DN group the defensive end group since you since you segue to that? How about quarterback since we're on offense? Yeah, I figure we can knock yeah. out offense. Um, it's not a huge deal. Mariota, one year, I believe up to six million, or sorry, one year base of six up to eight, eight and a half, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah. I I seen a lot on Twitter and everywhere saying that this means that we're now drafting Jaden Daniels because of the fact that he's a more of a mobile style. And I'm just laughing at people because they went after Darnold before I know, that's the, Mariota. Yeah. So I mean it, it makes no sense. Yeah, they they were they were kind of, they were in conversation with, with Darnold before that. So I I literally just think mm -hmm. that Peters and company are looking at the best possible person for the scenario that we're in, and they're 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 you know they're targeting those guys. I don't think I it. Can think of three good reasons off the top why you go with a guy like Mariota. He's not 
coming here thinking he's going to be the starter. He's not, there's no drama there. He's connected to, is it Brian Johnson, right? Coming down yes. from Philadelphia. So they know him. Uh, yeah. Other than his little hiccup in Atlanta, he's known as a strong team and locker room guy. Um, absolutely, you bring in a veteran. He's not coming in to compete to start here. And I'm sure he knows that. I, He's not the guy that I would have picked. He wasn't on my radar. I would have just as soon kept Kobe Brissett if it was up to me because I think he was underrated. But we're going to be a cheap, have a cheap quarterback room, man, between possibly two rookies or, and we don't know what they're going to do with Hal, but um, you know, they paid him 6 million uh, with, I think up to 10 in incentives. So, I mean, that's, that's about the cheapest quarterback situation you could have. You're going to be, have tons of money to spend on guys that aren't under center. And that's a lot different from most NFL teams. Plus Mark, to your point about, uh, Brissett, it dawned on me. He signed with New England. There's a pretty good chance he's starting. Yeah, one. yeah. which it makes sense for him, right? Jay? Right. He he's not going to start here. The chances are, yeah, his, with that opportunity came up, I think that he was gone. It, it's I feel very... good for him. I, ho I hope he does get to start. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think it means, the Mariota signing means, if anything, uh, relative to Sam Howe? What do you think? I um, think it means more for Howe than it does who we're drafting. I think, I think Howe's – I think they're actively shopping how, and if they get anything better than maybe a fifth, I think he's gone. I think he's traded. Maybe, maybe. And I, I think for a third, I don't know that I could turn that down for a fourth. Maybe I ideally, and my first reaction to this, John and I talked about this a couple of days ago when they first, when I first heard they brought in Mariota, I thought, so they're bringing in Mariota to compete with Sam to be the number two quarterback. And I, I kind of like that scenario. It gives Sam a chance um, we just, I wish I knew what they thought of Sam Howell, what they're saying, right? Because that changes everything. We don't know what they think of him. And, uh, he, <laughs> you know, I kept reading all these people going, this means they're drafting Jaden Daniels. I tell you, who else Mariota reminds me of? Sam Howell. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I agree. I, I admit it. I've got, I've, I've got blinders on. A, I say blinders on a little bit. I, I'm hopeful. I, I saw a lot to really like in Sam last year. And I, and I would really hate to see the young man thrown to the curb simply because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that's really the reality, right? I mean, just the wrong place, the wrong time, put in a wrong, in a poor situation by people that should have known better. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the kid has a legit future in this league. I mean, it, Eight games into the season last year, we were talking about Sam Howell as a as as an MVP contender for the year, right? I mean, ESPN and NFL Network both had his name on the short list for MVP of the year. And and I, I remember doing the math at 10 games, if the defense had even been playing remotely decent football, we would have been above 500 because Sam Howell was throwing the ball and doing well. So... Do I think we keep Sam? I don't know. Do I think we draft a quarterback at two? Sadly, I'm afraid we probably do. Um, and I do mean sadly, because I don't feel like it's going to go well. And I'm very concerned about that. I pray this time next year, I'm eating my words. But there you go. My friend, Bob, take my advice. Pull down your pants and slide on the ice. Oh, <laughs> Chris, what oh, do you think? I want to hear what Sydney. Chris thinks about how, about the, whether it means anything for how. Uh, I hope that it means that uh, Sam Howell and Marcus Mariota will compete for the backup job. Um, that would be ideal for me um, because I think that Hal has very much the potential to, if he is going to be traded, he'll be worth more later than he, than he is today. Um, as you get toward the beginning of the season or injuries happen or all of a sudden a team's in a desperate situation, um, I think he, he'll, he would return more value than he would if they traded him today. So um, just, to wrap, just to wrap a bow on it, I think that Adam Peters is way too smart to undervalue a guy that everyone thinks he's about to trade. Because the second you sign Marcus Mariota, you have no leverage. You have You've totally devalued a Hal trade. And I think they're a lot smarter than that. So that's just my rationale. Maybe I'll, they'll probably trade them tomorrow, but 
I don't think he's going anywhere. And I mean, kid's got an NFL arm. Say what you will about anything else. He, he's got an NFL arm and you don't, it's insane to trade a, a essentially a second year guy. Although we know he's going into his third season that has that kind of an arm. It's insane to do that. So can I, can I do this to you guys? But put, what's your price on Sam Howell? Somebody offers you a third. Yeah. Or nay. Yeah. Probably okay. have to say, yeah, but. A third's hard to turn down, but I, I think I, that's I think, my price too. Look, but we we're also talking philosophically. There's a lot of things that that determine. I have said it multiple times on here, and I'll say it again. I am not locked in on quarterback at number two overall, anyway, because I, I you know, and we've had this discussion. So I I don't know that I would completely dismiss. If I was the GM, Sam Howell starting for another year and continuing to build the roster so that the new so that we can expand the window of the rookie quarterback we take. Now, a lot of the moves that we've seen since we've had this conversation might accelerate the ability to win. Um, I don't know that it's putting us into contention yet. I think we've raised the floor immensely on this roster. Um, but how far the ceiling has been raised is yet to be determined. Uh so I, I guess if I'm drafting a quarterback at two, I'll take a three for Sam. I don't. How about if you're trading down into later in the first and still taking your quarterback, which is what I think is a very realistic possibility here. So we had one other big offensive signing. Um, we'll take that up later. <laughs> Austin Eckler uh, signed him for a two year deal. And Austin Eckler led the NFL in touchdowns in 2021 and 2022. Had a little bit of a down. Here's a down year for Austin Eckler. He only had over a thousand yards rushing and six touchdowns last season in a in a bad year. <laughs> That's basically the best running back performance that we've had. You know, pretty much on par with. And word is he played hurt most of the year, right? He wasn't. Right. He was not 100. percent Well. I, that's the worst running back. It's the best running back performance we've seen in a while. But I'd also like to point out that our running back sat on the shelf last year and gathered dust for the most part, uh, unless unless Sam was throwing him the ball. Um, so that's I, I don't know. I mean, you can you can only you can only produce if you're given the ball. And Brian Robinson wasn't exactly given the ball a lot. And Antonio Gibson was given the ball even less. So I, don't get me wrong. I'm excited about Eckler. I do think he's an upgrade over Gibson, um, you know, but I don't know. I, I, I was a little, that's one of those head scratchers for me. I feel like bringing in Eckler on a two-year deal is the move that a, a contender that's missing that key third down component, you know, brings in. That's a, that's like a, that's a San Francisco or Kansas City signing. I'm a little to, surprised that Eckler came here. To but the he point. is he is a pros pro man. He's a pros pro. He's he could be part of it. Could be that mentorship role in addition to still being a hell of a. Well, he's runner. got a relationship with Anthony Lynn, who is just by the way our running backs coach. So, um, additionally, he is the perfect signing for a transition of a rookie quarterback. Bingo. That's what I was just going to say. Yes. Um, so to the to the where I'm looking at it more is that 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 move is that tells me more about drafting a quarterback at two than Mariota does because um, you don't pay a guy like Eckler coming in is exactly what you need a guy who can be dynamic in the pass game who can completely bail out your quarterback on on a an extremely consistent basis. And do whatever you need him to do. And he's not coming in to start, right, and be your bell cow and carry 25 times a game. He's a he's a situational and third down back veteran, an outlet for your rookie quarterback. I I think it's a, I I love the signing. I'm having hard I'm having a hard time really being critical of any of them so far, and I'm I'm trying not to go too far down that road. But this one, my reaction on this one when I first heard it was, oh hell yeah, he he'll, he'll look great on third downs coming out of the backfield. And Kingsbury will find ways to get him the ball in space. I mean, that's what he does. That's what Eckler was built to do that. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with Bob. I wasn't in love with Antonio Gibson at all. 
and I'm quite happy with uh, the, the, for trading Eckler for Gibson. Yeah. I'm happy with that. Yeah, concur. I'm trying to remember if I saw this on Twitter or if somebody put it on the board. You know, Gibson's got the reputation as a as a guy that puts the ball on the ground. Eckler has fumbled half again as many times more <laughs> than Gibson over the last four years uh, and lost more of those fumbles than Gibson over the last four years. And yet he doesn't have the reputation. What's the, that that? What's, What's the about? difference in number of carries? Yeah, I was about to say number of touches. I mean, he's catching, he had 100 plus targets not that long ago. I mean, he's. Doesn't really matter if you're Gibson's putting. Gibson's a good player, ground, man. Right? Gibson's so, one uh, of the best top three yes. players we've had over the last four years. And I, I'm and not, he, I don't mean to sound like I'm knocking Antonio. If we'd re signed, he might have been fine with it. Um, I'm, I'm just saying that I'm not. I'm not as unhappy about letting Antonio go to New England as I would be if, you know, a couple of other guys left this team. How about that? I'm Bob, the point I'm not uh, the point I'm making is he is going to be and again, I agree there is a there is a level of concern with fumbles there. But when you're last season, he carried the ball 179 times and mm -hmm. he caught the ball uh or another 51 times when you're doing that in, in the year before 204 carries 107 receptions on 127 targets he's touching the ball more which means there's a more likelihood that he's going to fumble that's all i don't think antonio gibson ever saw that number uh, targets on that level or no. carries no he did not um he couldn't he antonio couldn't have carried that workload from the line of scrimmage passing maybe but he couldn't have he I mean, we tried that with him as a rookie and and he spent half the season injured. Um, you know, and when they when they pushed his carry limit up, you know, he started, you could tell. So I Eckler's got a level of of durability that we probably see in Robinson, but we never saw in Gibson. Eckler's also got a level of juice that we haven't seen in a while. Yeah, when you watched when I watched the Chargers play the last couple of years, Eckler he just keeps jump he jumps off the screen at you the way he plays the game. He's mm. kind of a hair on fire guy, which seems to be a pattern around here the last two days. All right, guys, let's talk about guys that are actually going to be on the team. Uh, <laughs> you mean Tyler Ott, uh, the long snapper we signed? <laughs> so which I he, hope I think he's a ginger guy again. <laughs> And so we had Red Snapper. I think we got to call him Red Otter. That's just I'm just throwing that out there. Uh, Technically, we have two long snappers on the team at the moment. No, we don't. Yes, we do. Who? Tucker Addington was signed to a two-year contract oh. in the middle of last season. Okay. When we when we cut Cheeseman, we brought in Addington. Addington. Okay. And he was signed through next offseason, and he has yet to appear on a cut list that I've seen. Okay. Mm. But to well, your point. Otter out is three-year deal. Um, he's. I saw today that apparently he and Tress Way know each other. They like played on rival high school, high school teams. football teams. Yep. So that's kind of a cool little tie-in. What and did Tress ended up winning that, that championship game? By the way, <laughs> oh, yeah. but I think the bigger note there, the bigger connection there is he's coming from Seattle, where right. he played for Izzo, and now you've got your long snapper who's controlling your special teams coverages. Your your blocking packages, your audibles, anything like that. You've now got him there and he's walking in the room already knowing everything. So we're gonna go back to never ever talking about the long snapper ever. That's <laughs> that's the hope. Yeah, I was gonna say here's to Tyler Ott. May we never say his name for the next three years. <laughs> yeah. Uh so you, we're not we're not gonna draft a long snapper this year. Trade up for him. Trade uh, up and draft for a long the, snapper. Trade up and draft for the him. best comment I've seen yet was from Nikki Javala. And on Twitter, she goes, Hey. We just saved ourselves a fifth round pick this year. <laughs> I was yeah. like, I was like, she goes, now we can use that on a position of need. <laughs> I was like, that's pretty awesome. Since we're on that that track, we should talk about our new place kicker too, right? McManus. Kind of a big deal. Yep. I all I could think of when I heard about that signing was our RGM sat in a booth and watched his team arguably lose the Super Bowl on a missed extra point. And yeah, he's thinking, not, oh, hell no, that's not happening again here. He's been around the block, man. This will be his 11th NFL season, but 
He's money. Like last year, he made 35 straight extra points. A little bit better field goal percentage than uh, Joey Sly, not dramatically, but he's just a guy that's not going to screw it up very often, which is what you want. Well, and to to his credit, well, to his benefit last season, he was kicking. He played in Denver, so I mean, he was kicking into much right. thinner air. <laughs> not not as good a long right. He's his, he's not known for over fifty, but you know. Well, if you can hit everything on a regular basis inside of 50 and extra points, that's money. I'll take it. The other thing to consider now with place kicker is the proposed rule changes with kickoffs. Um, and the, the rule change that they're talking about now is that uh, touchbacks come out to the 35 now, no longer the 25. So having that guy that Joey Sly, who's a hundred percent, Touchback percentage is no longer a benefit. Not as big a benefit anyway. It's like the NFL can't figure that out, right? The for safety reasons, we're going to try to minimize kick returns, but now they're going to penalize teams for kicking it through the end zone and basically force kick returns again. Yeah, but they're also playing with the XFL rules where the, the kicking team lines up five yards away from the receiving team's blocking package downfield. They can't move until the ball is caught. A lot of things to try to eliminate that 100 mile there's, an hour collision at the. There's too many damn committees. I'm telling in the you. NFL. That's the problem. Like, just stop. Just stop. Just because you have a committee doesn't mean you need to, you know, change. <laughs> make, rule, yeah, make rule changes. All right. So let's get into the grease here. Um, so the, the position we clearly addressed the most of was defensive end edge. Oh, I'm teeing you up for last, brother. Don't get too excited, Mark. Uh, Dorrance Armstrong was the biggest contract, three years up to $45 million. I want to say it was around 30 guaranteed, 31 if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, something like that. Cleveland Farrell, uh, one-year prove-it deal. I want to say it was about three and a half, if I'm remembering. And then Dante Fowler. Funny note with Dante Fowler, apparently he was recruited by Dan Quinn at University of Florida to the point where he had committed to Florida State, and then on signing day he switched. And I think Chris put that nugget on the board, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I'm a Florida State fan. I still remember that very well. So then he ended up going to Atlanta to play for Dan Quinn. Then he went to Dallas to play for Dan Quinn, and now he's in Washington playing for Dan Quinn. So three hard rushers signed one of which to a deal beyond two years, which I think it actually is just a, basically a two-year deal uh, with a third-year option, and then uh, two other rotational guys. How are you guys two, feeling about that? rotational guys are former first top five draft picks. Oh, before we move on to, <laughs> we have to tip of the cap to Paul because he did talk about Tyler Biotish in the pod last week about free agents yes. we can target. I'll give him credit. Not to toot my own horn. I talked about Farrell. I like it. So that it, you can see what where we're headed, right? With this, with the defensive philosophy, they're going to bring waves of guys, it's, and none of these guys are necessarily flash speed rushers. They're solid, play hard, hit hard, tackle. I, I'm seeing a nice, a healthy rotation going on, and maybe trying to free up Payne and Allen inside with stunts and all the kinds of things we haven't been doing around here. Um, yeah, I'm pretty confident we will draft an edge maybe in round two or three if they find a guy there, a speed guy. Um, but I'm watching these guys come in and I'm going and doing at least a little bit of YouTube just so I can get a sense of what they look like on the field and how they play. And there's a pattern there. You got guys who who seem to know how to play the game and come out, they come hard. Lawrence, Lawrence Armstrong very quietly had the second most sacks on the Dallas roster last year behind parsons right i mean and he wasn't even a starter i think he uh, played 45 percent of the snaps or something yeah i mean so it's not like he was out there on even a majority of the snaps and he still had the second highest sack total on a team that was near the top of the league in sacks so uh the dudes the i, I watched uh i watched an interview today with the atlantic's the Dallas version of Ben Standig, effectively, right? He's he's the Atlantic guy that that's dedicated to the Dallas team, and he he said that Armstrong was a guy he was really sad to see leave. Um, that that he felt like he, but but he probably needs more snaps now than he was going to get in Dallas because he wasn't going to displace any of the starters. 
And even though they were rotational, that he wasn't going to get as many snaps as he deserved. Now, the question is whether or not he will be able to make the move from part time to full time. Although, is anybody full time on the defensive line in the NFL anymore? So, yeah, like, yeah, again, that that's that's where I'm coming from. I don't think we're going to have guys who are, are every down starters out on the outside unless we draft someone who becomes one. I think we're going to go heavy rotation. I just wanted to throw one little this food for thought out there. One thing I, I wasn't thinking we would do, you know, I mentioned that I did, I really was shocked that how aggressive we've been just in the volume of guys that we signed, um, especially amazing considering this, you know, this is a new regime and they've probably been, you know, working overtime to catch up with the rest of the league in terms of the plan. But I really think the when you bring in the kind of guys that we brought in already, you're really freeing yourself up to the when we get to the draft, you can do anything because we've we're going to have met so many position needs going into the draft that weren't they're not going to feel they're not going to have that pressure like we might have otherwise with well, all it, the, you know they can pick the guy that they think has is the best player whether or not it's a, you know we it would have been a position of need player before and that's in really addition cool. to that that's where where I say we've brought the floor up is we could draft an edge high that we weren't expecting and we're not bringing in a draft pick in an area where we're handcuffed by a large contract elsewhere. The same thing can be said for linebacker, cornerback, everywhere. Um, so with these short contracts that we've been talking about, it's it, it does free that up, where if you see the right guy, you can take him without the worry that, well, I've already got somebody on the roster making too much money for me to yeah. bring this guy in. As we sit today and looking at the available players at the position that could be brought in as free agents, offensive tackle, I don't think they can screw around and go, well, what would we like to do? They got to get a tackle. We don't have a tackle on the left side at long. That's got to be a huge priority. I, I think we've got to have two tackles. I mean, I'm looking uh, at the draft. At and a I'm minimum. Thinking, I wouldn't. A minimum, a left tackle. You know, right now, uh, if – if we don't draft a quarterback at two, we kind of have to take a tackle. And I feel like one of those two first picks in the second round has to be a tackle as well. I mean, I'm looking uh, – and uh, I've seen a several people theorize that Peters will do some shopping in the post-draft, uh, you know, the second round of free agency that happens later in the year when teams really get a good look at their draft picks and go, all right, I don't need this guy anymore. And, 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 you know, there's always some guys that get let go in May and June that people expected to be on somebody's roster. And there's guys that get let go at the end of camp too. Yes. Right? No, guys you're absolutely who... right. And, and I think the best front offices have a really good feel for who may be getting let go later in the year. You know, I mean, I, I know good. He's Peters has got to be looking at other teams in the league and going, this guy's, vulnerable and that guy's vulnerable and you know so who knows we we beefed up the the defensive end group significantly but you cannot underestimate what we did with safety and linebackers because we also we did the exact same thing at those positions so let's talk about linebacker next because holy cow wait wait what was that word (laughs) (laughs) lb what was that word (laughs) I, you know, I, I had linebacker when we talked about him. Was that just last week that we talked about linebacker? Mm-hmm. Was it, we talked about possibly, you know, and I brought up the possibility of Wagner. I'm a little stunned by today's news because everything I have read for the last week said he wasn't leaving the West coast, that he just absolutely refused to play anywhere, but the West coast. And now here he is playing in Washington this next year. I, I'm blown away. And, quite frankly, really impressed with the front office and this coaching staff because Wagner's Wagner's got some experience, but the dude still play. What do you have? 133 this year? 183. 183. 183. Led the league in tackles this year. And Bob, to get him on day three, that's really impressive because you know there were a lot of teams that would love to have had Bobby Wagner. Um, And he's, he's one year older than London Fletcher was when he came into Washington. So just to give you some perspective on that front. How about a guy like Bobby Wagner being willing and interested in coming across the country on a one-year deal? 
to come play with this defense. It, if you start stop to think about what that part of it means. So <clears throat> that Bobby Wagner signing today was the first one that made me think I'd put this stupid hat on backwards and do dance. <laughs> I bought this hat specifically to wear when good <laughs> shit happens for our team. This will be my Monday win hat. God hope, hope we get to wear it a lot. But today, this was the first one that I kind of stopped. John, I was driving home from playing golf and John texts me and says, you hear they got Wagner today. And I was just for the first time, I'm like, oh, Fuck yeah. Because <laughs> what this says to me, it's not about Bobby Wagner being Bobby Wagner from 10 years ago. This is about Bobby Wagner being a first ballot Hall of Fame player, still getting it done, sacrificing money and a, and a long term final security contract to come across the country to be that guy in our locker room, to be the character guy, to be the mentor guy, to be the you are accountable guy. It just complete game changer for me in the tone of that defense. He's instant leadership on the field. We talked about this a bunch of times last year. John Allen is kind of a leader on the field, but who's the fiery guy who you know is holding people accountable? We signed him today, guys, and he wanted to come here to be part of this. If Good Lord, if, if you can't, as, as a long-suffering Washington fan, and, you know, the linebacker thing is, yeah, it's it's funny. We don't do linebackers here until now. Now we do them again. But that one, to me, is, is the one that just kind of made this go boom, boom. Here we go. Let's do it. And look at the other guy we brought in, right? I'm going to call him you because mm -hmm. I think I'm I'm going to love him. But <laughs> Voodoo, Frank, Voodoo, Voodoo Child. Three-year contract and – I mean, that guy can play. Uh, that's a legit linebacker. So to get to get um, Wagner and him um, in the first three days of free agency, that's that's really something. Well, Vulu rhymes with the Yoo-Hoo or Woo-Hoo. What wasn't Vulu like the top rated free agent linebacker on a lot of lists coming into free yeah. agency? Another Aaron Aaron Clark, quietly yeah. signed him. Oh, by the way, come on down and and be the be the mic that we haven't had here. Well, I know maybe Bobby will have something to say about that now, but come, I've, that's another exciting signing. When you watch him play, he's, he's an older, uh, the one that got away from me was James Bolton. That's the guy I wanted us to bring in. And now he's just tearing it up for KC. I see Vulu in that same mode. Sideline. So side Lulu is the only guy I wrote stats down on. And I just want to give, give you his 2023 stats. 5.5 sacks. 125 tackles, 11 quarterback hits, 10 tackles for loss, and two forced fumbles. That's that's big time. Air on fire, violent. Yeah. Well, I, you know, the thing that all of these signings have said to me is we're going after the quarterback, and you don't know where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because all of these guys, every single one of them, including a couple of the guys we still have here in Allen and Payne have extensive histories of getting to the quarterback. And so pressure can come from anywhere amongst that front seven, maybe eight, depending upon how close to the line chin plays um, or Quan Martin for that matter. I mean, who could, who can line up deep or, or up closer to the box. So going to be interesting. Uh, to your point, Mark, I think ultimately what happens is, Wagner's wearing the green dot. He's the middle. Um, Luvu is a bigger, I shouldn't say bigger, taller. Wagner's six foot, 240, and he had 183 tackles. So the he's still in shape. Let's be real. <laughs> like, that's not, you know, grandpa at the end of his career. But uh, Luvu, I believe, is what, 6'3", around 240. He's not the fastest blazing speed guy. But he's aggressive. So I could see a situation where Wagner's in the middle, Davis and Luvu are outside at times. You can move them around. You can even put you can even have Luvu put his hand down in the dirt and be a fifth pass rusher um on the edge of the line of scrimmage outside of the ends. Or put him at end and stand up one of those other guys. Um I I think all of these things, and then we can transition into the safeties because it, it comes into that conversation um, with Chin, who is 
in his own right, 6'3", 220, and runs a 4'4", 5". I, I want to see what impact Bobby Wagner can have on our talented knucklehead. Mm -hmm. Our talented Jamie knucklehead Davis, could, yeah. be, could be a really great player, I think, physically. Well, but that's, mentally, mentally, he's not there. That's kind of where I was going. Is You have Wagner in the middle, and then they're moving. And, it, and, it, and, and you can literally go to Davis and say, on this call, it is – it's like the guy from the program, you know what I mean? Where it's like kill the quarterback or the guy from the replacements where he's like, I need you go get me the ball and I'm going to get you the ball. Like, you know what I mean? You can simplify life to the point for him where he's not, don't worry about aligning defense. It's this is your responsibility on this play. Go do it. This is your responsibility on this play. Go do it. Um, Cause remember Bobby Wagner was part of Dan Quinn's defense in Seattle when it was a Legion of Boom. So chances are he's also walking in with it already with the learning curve of understanding more about it than the other two guys. So there's going to be a lot there, I think, with him being able to manipulate things. I agree with you, Derek, that, that Wagner seems like the default green dot guy to begin. Listen to the write-up from uh, – this is from Panthers Wire, from one of the Panthers writers about Luvu before he signed away. Uh -huh. Last season played 56% of his snaps at inside, 23% outside, and the rest at the line of scrimmage, either as a stand-up rusher or a blitzer. Seven sacks, 20 pressures, 84 solo tackles, 47 stops, whatever that, that means – 10 tackles for loss and was great in coverage. If you need a green dot guy in the middle of your defense, there's nobody better or more versatile in this free agency class. Another, so you get Wagner to mentor this guy. And yep. Lou, 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 I'll get it right one of these times. I mean, he could be the starting Mike for the next X number of years, fill in your number. So we talked about a little bit about Reeves already, I think, when we talked about mm -hmm. the two uh, internal signings so far. What about Jeremy Chen? He's he is he before Wagner, he he was the one that got me the most amped up on the defensive side of the ball. Because um years ago I was big on Isaiah Simmons. I uh, and somebody posted on the board. He or somebody posted on Twitter about him, and I said the dude is an Uno wild card. Okay, he can do things that most humans can't do, and he's not a ball hawk. Okay, he is not a guy that's got 15 interceptions over three seasons or anything. But like I said, six three two twenty can run a four four. I mean, there are not very many people that physically are built capable of doing those kind of things. And in a matchup league where you need to win matchups, especially now that Saquon's in Philly, even though now I just saw somebody speculating a report that Roseman talked to him before the de the legal tampering period, so now there's going to be an investigation. But that we'll see if that's actually credible. And some of the other things that are out there, having a guy like that who can play on the line of scrimmage, who can drop back in coverage, who can run back and be a third safety, and who can basically – also be an outside linebacker. It's, it's just huge to have that kind of opportunity, uh, that kind of guy. He also I, has position flex, right? He, yes, he, he can yes. play, he can play free or, or strong or linebacker. You or can line him up as an outside linebacker. Yeah. He can hold his own. So he's basically the cam curl replacement, I guess, in my mind. Is that you guys on board with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, unless cam doesn't get any interest out there, right. He might be back. So he was in he was in the 2020 class. He was I think he was a runner up to Chase Young for defensive rookie of the year in 2020. I think yeah, that's right. He was. How's that working out, Chase? <clears throat> He's still still unsigned. Still unsigned. <laughs> and down there at Carolina, I I don't want to say anything bad about the guy, but I I will admit when I heard he's going to have to go to Carolina, I was thinking, gee, that would suck for him. Well, it's a clown show down there right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you did you just see what they paid their starting guard? No, I didn't see the number. Tell me. Four, four years, a hundred million dollars. Well, that was Hunt they got from Miami, right? Yes. Yeah. We've already been down that road, right? We already well, we franchise sh sh sheriff. So twenty five million dollars for their for the guard they just signed. That's old school Redskins. Yeah. 
Right. There. And the Giants did that with with Burns paid this yeah, prime ridiculous, prime. Oh, ridiculous contract. But I remember looking today online and looking at these, I think, 47 free agency signings we've now made. And they've used, what, half the cap available cap space, whatever, a little 60 percent. They are not giving up big money to change the foundation of this team. It's pretty so, impressive work so far. I posted I think, a Go ahead, Derek. Sorry. I think I saw the rough math was we're still over 40 or 50 million. And that's if you take into account the rookie pool. Yeah. Yeah. The last I saw, we were 55, but that was before Reeves and Crowder. Wagner. And what and doing? We're doing this. Crowder. Thing. Yeah. We're not blowing big money on yeah. big names. We're, we're building, we're rebuilding a foundation. And this is, I mean, this is year one. It's going to be hard to remember that within all the excitement, but this is year one of a complete flush. And re yeah, we're going to need roster cards at for the first half of the season, man. If, like, who is that? <laughs> half of chat of our game chats will be, who was that? <laughs> Number 28. <laughs> um, I posted a graphic. I don't know who it's from, so I apologize, but I posted it on the board at bgobsession.com today where mm. they were, rank they were basically ranking a team roster improvement uh by based on free agency we were number two right behind atlanta on that graphic and that was before we signed bab babby babby wagner <laughs> <laughs> that was before the wagner and reeves signing so anyway i think we're doing pretty damn well, well i don't think atlanta's gonna run away with that because of the kirk cousin signing you sign yeah. a franchise quarterback you're gonna you're gonna own that but didn't that same graphic show the Ravens as the worst? And I'm yeah. thinking, really? They just that. they just signed fucking King Henry to Yeah, but they yeah. they lost they lost Queen and they lost somebody else. Yeah. Well, I know. I'm wondering if uh, personally I spent some time today wondering if John Allen was a little less surly now mm. than mm -hmm. he was at the end of the locker room cleanup. Yeah, you gotta imagine Allen, Allen and Payne are on the phone <laughs> talking about, yeah. hey bro, we're gonna eat this year. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna. Get I it. imagine that Wit and he and Quinn have had some conversations already about like that was yesterday. This is today. Yeah. So get on board when they the 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 linebacker signings, the two big linebacker signings, brought to mind to me listening to Joe Wit at his inaugural press conference talking about the way we are gonna play. Yeah, we are. We are putting meat on them bones but fast what did he say? fast and violent is that what he said yeah and and if you if you know that's not who you are and what you want to do you're probably not going to be playing here so what we've got some cash as you guys just went over left not that they have to spend every dime of it but i don't think they're done so let's take a stab not necessarily at players or although you're welcome to do that what position group do you think they will will continue to try to boost it with the remaining time and free agency. I, uh, and I'll go last. Well, but two, we haven't touched our corner and, and offensive tackle. So. My two. And the, the, you know, that I've been over and over and over the tackles that are out there. Um, the best guy out there is the guy from Cincinnati and he absolutely positively wants to be a left tackle. And I fully expect us to draft a left tackle. Are you talking about Jonah this? Williams? Uh yeah, no he he just signed, he signed with Arizona. He signed. Oh, did he? He signed today then? Because he yeah. signed about twenty minutes before we got on this podcast. Okay, all right, I missed that, but I mean, no. he's like the cream of the crop, and everybody else is 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 the wrong side of thirty. And yeah, Tyron Ty Smith either. is the biggest name right now, and his his stock is plummeting. Well, I you know, and the problem with Tyron Smith is that he's 33 years old and he hasn't played a full season. He has not gotten a full 16 or 17 games, depending upon which season you're looking at, since 2016. Mm -hmm. And two of those seasons, he didn't play more than four games. Right. So he got injured at the very beginning of the season and was out for the year. I, I'm not paying that guy big money. So... Bob, I listened to that interview today. It might not have been the same interview. It might have been another with the guy from The Athletic that covers the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. um, with Craig Hoffman? And with Hoffman. And he was talking about uh, Tyron Smith. And he said McCarthy had to have a plan for him where basically he didn't do any any physical practice all week long just so he could play on Sundays. Yeah. Um, and we don't want to, you know, yeah. we need a left tackle really badly, but I don't want to start out that way. Well, so, something tells me news is the coaching staff. Yeah. <laughs> You know, yes. and, and here's the thing. Quinn would know 
all of that. Mm -hmm. So would win. Mm -hmm. so, so remember, best tackle class in like a decade or more. It, I don't it, think we're going to tackle in the draft. My own caveat that they may not, they may, they, they could be wrong about that, but. Which I think brings us right back around to cornerback, right? Um, and and I will be really surprised if they don't sign another corner in the next few days. I'd also be surprised if they didn't bring in a little more offensive line depth in the next couple of days. That's what I think is going to happen. I think we're going to sign some big, ugly, if, you know, it's uh, depth on the O line. If we think can see the holes at tackle, the front office is yeah. seeing the holes too. Oh, they're aware of it. I'm sure. But well, it, it, I wouldn't be surprised if they have looked at this draft class and said, all right, look, we've got six of the top 102 picks in the draft. We're going to take, if they take quarterback at two, we're getting back up into the top 15 and taking a tackle. Right. Uh, yeah, I agree. We nailed the position groups that guys, I, I'll give us a little bit of credit last week. We nailed um, every position group they, they touched. We talked about right. except for running back. Even kicker we talked about. Mm-hmm. Well, gents, it has been an extreme couple days that something we haven't seen in a long time and beyond just free agent signings, it has been prudent and intelligent moves. At least that's the way it looks so far. So we've had exciting free agencies in the past, but not not like this where you can look at it and say, I can actually see some a direction. A, a direction and a consistency with what they've been saying and Peter said and Quinn has said is that we're not building to patch holes and try to contend right away. We're trying to build uh, an organization that can compete year after year. You do that by setting a really solid floor, which is what they're doing now in year one. Come year two, all these one-year contracts, you know, if these guys are working out, you try to bring them back. If not, you bring in someone else. They're setting a tone and showing to me what looks like it's almost uh, contradictory sounding, but they've signed 14, 15, 77 guys, but they're being patient because they're not, they're not swinging at the fences, trying to bring in guys that are going to help us win right away. They're trying to build a foundation of character and uh, the kinds of players they want to be here. And that will, I mean, that feeds itself, right? You'd like to think that next year, if we continue doing this kind of thing, other free agents are going to be looking around saying, yeah, that's a place I'd like to go play. Uh, to circle it up. Jeremy Chin actually came out and said he turned down more money elsewhere or a longer deal because he wanted to come here and play for Dan Quinn. Um, I know somebody said there were two or three of them. I know Jeremy Chin said it. I saw it reported, but I don't know. I might have missed the other one. I have to I, Bobby I'm Wagner. Had positive Luvu said something similar, Derek. That okay. He, that he, you know, he he wanted to play here. <clears throat> okay. So, and all I can I, think of is Witt's introductory press conference. Mm -hmm. And some of these guys sitting out there knowing they're going to hit free agency. I want to his press conference and going, that's agent. a coach I want to play for. Yeah. Call my agent real quick. Hey. Yeah. Think, yeah. Let's go. So what we'll do starting next week is we will be breaking down position groups for the draft. We'll obviously, if there's some uh, additional signings, we'll talk about that as well, but we're going to start breaking down by position group, who we like in the draft. And again, I'm going to toot our, our horn a little bit. We've been pretty damn good at doing that in the past. Not always who we drafted, but we definitely picked out guys that ended up uh, being, you know, very good players in the NFL. So mm -hmm. Guys, let let think about doing this too. I'd like to do a, a a little segment on what it what the kinds of signings and the kinds of players we're bringing in tell you about maybe the kinds of systems we're going to run on both sides of the ball. Because right now we're we're still talking about players and in the draft about players whose measurables are this and that and the other thing. I'm interested to find out what we think and how we think they are going to fit into what we're trying to do here. Well, and we've also really actually finally seen some choices yeah i don't think you know, it's it, so, to have that conversation based on what we've seen in the last couple of days because to your point you don't do what you just did and have luvu and not have luvu and wagner both on the field right yeah you don't and and you don't sign the three defensive ends to not have a rotation there and be utilizing them 
Yep. Um, We're starting to see some tea leaves that we can read. Mm -hmm. All right, fellas, as always, it's been a pleasure. We'll hit it right at an hour and we'll be back next week. Good job, guys.